Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my weekly video series in which I go over an older game. Um, you're not going to see crazy old games on this series, like from the 60s or 70s or even older, um, <clears throat> but at least from earlier in the hobby. Um, I figure lots of new people are coming into the hobby. They're just awash with a flood of games, some old, obviously a lot new of new ones coming out. And since I kind of favor some of the old games, I just thought, oh, I'll just go over some, some old games. Maybe some new people don't know much about them, but they're still worth looking at. They're still worth playing today. The game I'm covering this week is a bit old, 1993. It originally came out in German only, I believe, um, and its name was Rettesischwer Kahn, which translates as everyone save yourselves if you can. Um, we know it in English from its 2006 edition, which was put out by Argentum. In English, we'd want to say Argentum, but it, it is Latin and it's a German company. So I'm gonna go with Argentum and the English edition from Z-Man, which is Lifeboats. It's for three to six players, ages, according to the box, 12 and up, 90 minutes to play. Now about the time length, it depends on number of players, but you do want a lot of people for this. Don't play this with three. Out of all the games in the world, if you have three players, don't look at this. But four is okay, five, now, now we're talking. And age range. Now, the, the box says 12 and up. It's a really simple game. Super, super simple rules. But it needs a level of maturity because there can be hard feelings. In this game, it's all about voting. It's a little bit of a one-note game. Vote, 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 vote. Uh, each player has a number of sailors spread out over several lifeboats. And each round, players vote on which lifeboat moves forward, which lifeboat takes on water, and, when necessary, whom gets thrown overboard? Whom gets thrown overboard? Which lifeboat takes on water? And when necessary, who to throw overboard? Throw he overboard. See, that's when I should use whom. God. And when necessary, whom to throw overboard? If one player gets picked on a lot, it could leave a really sour taste in their mouth. So I wouldn't recommend this with a group, like with a group of kids where the kids could conspire to pick on a kid they don't like. But a mix of adults and kids, as long as the adults kind of back off on the kids a little bit, don't give them a hard time, or of course with adults, um, it's perfectly fine. So I'll show you how it plays first, then I'll talk more about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. Each player chooses a color. Of that color, they get five small pawns, which represent the sailors and two kind of big-headed pawns, which represent the officers. They also get a little disc, which just reminds people of what their color is, as well as one lifeboat. Although keep in mind that lifeboats aren't really owned by the players, but they are the same colors as the player colors. If you're playing with five or six players, you're gonna leave one of the, one of the sailors behind, put them back in the box. Place the leaks, that's these little blue discs, near the board. Determine the start player. The start player gets this large wooden black disc. This will rotate every round. As well as the black lifeboat. And give each player a hand of cards. They're going to get one color for every lifeboat in the game. So one color for each of the player colors, as well as a black card for the black lifeboat. And each player also gets three captain's cards. Starting with the start player, and then going clockwise, each player places their color lifeboat on one of these seven spaces. You'll see there's lanes. Each lane has four spaces on it. It's going to be the start space, one, two, three, in which point they've arrived at the island. So the start player takes their colored lifeboat and places it on the starting space on any of the seven lanes. And then all players in clockwise order do the same. And then the start player takes the black lifeboat and places it in a remaining lane. Now, starting with the start player, each player 
takes one of their pawns, and it can be a sailor or an officer, they choose, they pick one of their pawns and place it on any empty space in any lifeboat. It doesn't have to be your own lifeboat, it could be any lifeboat. And all players are going to take turns doing that until all the pawns are placed. The goal of the game is to save as many of your sailors and officers as possible. To do that, your sailors, your pawns, have to be on lifeboats that arrive at these islands. If a lifeboat makes it all the way to an island, then all the pawns on that lifeboat disembark and will score points. So uh, a, a sailor, just a regular small pawn, would score five points here, four points here, six points here, and an extra two for an officer. So officers, officers' lives are just worth more than a sailor's. It's just a fact of life. And each round, a lifeboat is going to spring a leak, and a lifeboat is going to move forward one space. If a lifeboat springs too many leaks, they might have to throw people overboard in order to keep the boat afloat. But almost certainly, some lifeboats will not make it uh, to the end and will sink. And all hands on board are lost. And at the end of the game, after all lifeboats have either made it to the islands or sunk, then players total up the points for all the pawns that were able to uh, survive. And the player with the most points wins. So the first thing that happens every round is players vote on which lifeboat springs a leak. By springing a leak, I mean add one of these little blue tokens to one of the empty seats on the lifeboat. In order to do that, players are going to vote. First, they'll have a little discussion period in which they talk about where they intend to vote, or maybe they encourage other players to vote the same way they do. The way I usually teach it is after a little bit of discussion, the player with the start player token can choose when to end discussion. Of course, it shouldn't be immediately. Give players a few moments to chat. But at some point, the start player can tap this. And then at that point, all discussion will stop. And then players will vote. In order to vote, players simply take one of their cards that they have and place it face down in front of them. And when all players have done so, then they all reveal. And the color with the most votes will be the color chosen. So in this first phase, what you're choosing is which lifeboat springs a leak. So you're going to total up all the votes. Now, of course, there are a few situations. Of course, there can be a tie. Maybe two players vote green, two players vote yellow. In the case of a tie, what would happen is the player with the start player token gets to choose amongst the tied colors which one is chosen. But what can also happen is players can choose a captain's card. These are one-time use cards. You choose it just like any other, and you reveal. And if you're the only player who plays a captain's card, then the other votes don't matter. The player who played the captain's card gets to choose. The catch is, is if multiple people play a captain's card, then those cards cancel each other out, and then you're only looking at the votes of the other players. So that's the catch. Regardless of whether the captain's card works or not, the card gets taken out of the game. You start with three, so you have three times that you can use the captain's card. Whether it works or not, it's gone. And all votes work the same way. You're voting on a color. It's either a color of lifeboat or a color of player. So this first vote in the round is which boat springs a leak. If the boat selected, let's say the green one here, has an empty seat on it, then you place the blue disc inside. And assuming that there are at least as many pawns in the lifeboat as there are leaks, then the lifeboat stays afloat. If at the end of a phase, and this is the first phase of the round, which is choosing which uh, lifeboat springs a leak, at the end of a phase, if there are more leaks than there are pawns, then the whole lifeboat sinks. Keep in mind, it can be a little hard to get these out. <laughs> But if a lifeboat is chosen that has no empty spaces, such as this one, then 
All players who have pawns on this lifeboat must vote. Because there's not enough room on the boat for all the pawns. So somebody has to be thrown overboard. Now in this case, Purple has no, even though this is Purple's lifeboat, again, it doesn't really matter who owns what lifeboat at this point. It's just for the convenience of voting on colors. The player colors and the lifeboat colors are the same. But all the players who have pawns on this lifeboat then get to vote. And they get a number of votes equal to their value, I suppose, of their pawns. So in this case, yellow would get two votes, one for each sailor. Green would get two votes, one for each sailor. And orange would get three votes, one for the sailor and one for the big-headed officer here. So orange obviously has an advantage. However, of course, yellow and green can work together. Their combined votes would be four, which would be greater than uh, orange's votes. So again, a little bit of discussion point. Purple is not involved. Of course, purple can still chat, but they don't get a vote. And then in the end, the players vote. And let's suppose no captain cards were played and yellow and green did indeed conspire to beat orange then Orange has to throw one of their sailors overboard. And in this case, Orange can choose. Orange isn't going to choose their officer. They're going to choose their lowly sailor. And their lowly sailor drowns. And the leak gets added to that space. Now, it's important to note that let's suppose Purple was the start player. Even though Purple has no votes on this boat, if it's a tie, Purple, as a start player, would indeed get to choose amongst the tied players who gets thrown overboard. And then there is another vote. This third and final vote of the round is which boat gets to move forward. And the vote happens exactly the same way. All players are involved. All players choose a color of lifeboat. And of course, you can also choose black as for the black lifeboat. And you can choose a captain's card in this vote, just like any other, to vote and choose which lifeboat moves forward. And if it's a tie, again, the player with the start player disc chooses amongst the ties which one moves forward. Let's suppose black was chosen. Black would move forward one space. It's important to note lifeboats never change lanes. A lifeboat only goes forward. However, pawns can change lanes. That's the last thing that happens in a round. Starting with the start player and going clockwise, each player picks one pawn from one of the lifeboats to jump out. So green, let's say green's like, oh, I, I don't like the looks of this lifeboat. Green would choose this lifeboat, say. So green picks up one of their pawns and places it behind the lifeboat just for now. They've jumped overboard, but they're still alive. And then in clockwise order, the next player will choose a pawn, but they have to choose a different lifeboat. If they can't choose a different lifeboat, if the only lifeboat's left for them to choose from, they don't have any pawns left, and they simply don't do anything in this part of the round. But orange would choose one if they're able to. Let's say orange would choose this one, and purple might choose this one, and then yellow, let's say, chooses this one. And then in reverse order, so starting with the last player and ending with the start player, players must choose a different lifeboat to jump on. And obviously there must be an empty space on them. So yellow, maybe yellow chooses this one. And then purple, purple's going to choose, let's suppose uh, this one. Orange, orange gets to choose. Now orange can choose either of these, but I'm gonna show you what happens, something special. Let's suppose orange chooses this one. A player is never ever allowed to jump back into the same lifeboat. Fortunately, green is also able to move into this boat because there is room. But if there is no room on this lifeboat, if all the seats in all the other lifeboats are full, green is not allowed to jump back into the same lifeboat. In this case, the pawn will be lost. But fortunately, green is able to go into this one because there's an empty space. And that's one full round. Then the start player passes to the next player in clockwise order. And you repeat, starting with voting on which boat gets a leak. And if there's not enough room for the leak, then voting on which player gets kicked out of the boat. 
voting on which lifeboat moves forward. And then finally, players take, take turns moving their pawns around in the lifeboats. Just repeats like that. If a lifeboat makes it to the third and final space in their lane, then all the pawns who are on there disembark. At the end of the game, they will score the points shown on the island. If a lifeboat ever, by the end of a phase, so after a, a vote, say, or at the end of a round, if there are more leaks in a lifeboat than there are pawns, then the lifeboat sinks. All pawns on that boat are taken out of the game, and the lifeboat is taken out of the game. But if a lifeboat makes it to the third and final space, then all the pawns on that lifeboat disembark on the island. They will score points at the end of the game. And then by convention, you're going to take the lifeboat and you're going to place it on the first available space on the side here. That comes into play as a tiebreaker at the end of the game. When all the lifeboats are either sunk or have made it to the islands and so are placed here, then players will total up the points on their pawns and the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, then you look and see which player's lifeboat, which color lifeboat, made it to the islands first, and that player wins the tie. That is the only time in which a player owns a lifeboat. That's it. You're ready to play lifeboats. I have to give some fair warning for this game, uh, because some people may like it, and there's no game quite like it, uh, but some people might really, really not like it. It's very easy for a player to have a, a hard time or a bad experience with this game. It's one note, all right? So it's all voting, voting, voting. So if you don't like voting and you don't like the discussions that, are, um, that take place before a vote, then you're not going to like this game because that's all the game is. You know, some people complain that such a game would devolve into a popularity contest. That's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, if you're not hurting the leader or the perceived leader, you're maybe not playing right. If you're picking on the same person over and over again, even if they've been hurt before, then I would argue you're not playing at your best. You, you want to spread the hate around a little bit, and then hopefully there are no hard feelings. But yeah, if one person just gets picked on, that's a problem. Um, so I could understand, like, it's really group dependent, right? If you have a mix of people, some people are shy, some people are outspoken. Um, and if the shy people start to have a bad experience because the talkative people start to pick on them, they're not going to like this game. So you, it's really group dependent. You really want like-minded people to play this game together. People who can get into the theme who can uh, chat. Um, you really want that experience. You want, you want people who are able to communicate and discuss back and forth and uh, maybe a bit of negotiating. About negotiating, it's not really a negotiation game. It's a voting game. There can be negotiation, but the thing about this game is that there, there isn't really anything tangible to negotiate for, right? Like it's not like Catan where you're trading resources or Bonanza, you're trading beans. You're trading at most future promises, right? Vote for vote with me now. Next time I'll vote with you, right? And of course that's non-binding. I could say that to you, and then you vote my way this time. And next time when you're relying on me, I there's no requirement for me to listen. I could totally abandon you. As negotiation games go, there are others that I would suggest before this one if you're interested in the negotiation aspect. But it can be there, right? It's definitely in that genre of games in which is very rules light and you're just all, it's all players talking with each other, coming up with plans. Um, if two players form an alliance, then it can be really hard on other players. But again, if you're playing to win, then you'll, other players will hopefully see that they should be forming an alliance too, right? If you're playing with five players and two people are forming an alliance, well, the other three should gang up on them, right? And that's one reason why I wouldn't recommend this with three. I mean, the game isn't very long with three, but what even is it for three, right? A voting game for three players is not anything that would attract me. But you get a sizable group of people. And you know what? You can play this at a big table, large group of people, six people, say, 
and uh, you know everybody can kind of see the state of things. It's not like you know I I talked about this with last week's game uh, Heimlich and Co. That there are some games that support a large group of people. That game supports seven, and which for some reason they'll give you a tiny little board. And if there's lots of stuff happening on the board, then there are people who are far away, they can't see what's going on, and they're just not invested. Red November is a game that's like that. At least the first edition had a really tiny board and plays up to eight people. This one, it's a big board, big pieces. The lifeboats are really sizable wooden pieces. And, uh, and it's pretty easy to see the state of things, even if you're not uh, close to the action. So it's, it's great as a big group game, assuming everybody can get into it. The components are great. The lifeboats are really big wooden pieces, really sizable. Uh, the pawns are fine. Sometimes the way it's cut, the larger officer pawns won't fit into the, the holes of the lifeboat, um, but it's a minor problem. Uh, the art on the cards is not for me. There might be people who love it, but I think it's a little weird. But it doesn't matter at all. The only thing that matters is the art on the board, if that even matters at all. And for the cards, you just care about the color, right? Now, the only way... The, the cards are different. The different colors have diff feature different artwork. But the only thing that matters is the color, and the color is kind of a border. And, you know, I could understand people like red and orange maybe getting mixed up. But I will say that all players have all cards available to them at all times. So they're, they're always able to compare. They'll always have, like, red and orange in their hand at the same time. So... It would be easy for them to, uh, to pick out the one that they need to. Uh, again, I want to stress, a group of kids should not play this game together. Group of adults? Sure. Mix of adults and kids? Sure. But the adults should go easy on the kids. Definitely don't gang up on kids. What kind of adult are you if you're ganging up on a kid anyway? Um, you know, let the kids play and be involved... And when it comes time to pick on somebody, pick on a fellow adult. So the game is really rules light. And I always respect a game that features just the bare, num bare minimum number of rules necessary to drive the player interaction a certain way. Last week's Heimlich and Co. was like that. Um, Cockroach Poker is like that. There's almost no rules. But the rules that are there are really drive the narrative. They really direct player interaction and player goals perfectly. So the game just melts away. There's hardly a game there. And it's all about the interaction. It's all about dealing with people. This is an experience game. It's not a game you're going to play every week. You'll probably get tired of it really quickly. But as a once in a while game, like if you have a large collection, you want games that stand out. You want games that are special. And Based on this situation, based on the type of people you have with you at that time, what's the perfect game? And in some situations, for some groups of people, for some sizes of groups, um, for some moods, there's often like the one perfect game. And sometimes it's lifeboats. It's a really special game in that regard. Every time you play it, it'll be an experience. You can definitely get burned out on it. But... If you play it just once in a while and play it for the experience, um, it's really something special. I don't think a used copy is crazy hard to find. I actually found, a, I used to own this, then put it in the restaurant, and then I recently got it again for myself, and it wasn't that hard to find. So I don't think it'll be crazy hard to find. There are more people wanting it than are trading it away, so it's not super common, probably, but uh, if you are looking for it, I'm sure you can find it, at least a used copy. And for what it's worth, I saw on Board Game Geek that the French edition of this actually just came out a couple of years ago. And the game is language independent, so if you don't mind seeking out a French copy, maybe that's the way to go. That's probably the best way to get a new copy of this game. Some people compare it to Diplomacy. So Diplomacy, I've only played Diplomacy once. That's a, that's a bucket list game. Try to play Diplomacy at least once in your life if you can uh, it was a fantastic experience. It took six hours and we had to call it, but in the end, I was still in the running. So I'll chalk that up for my first game as a victory. Um, but that game, like I just said, right, can take six hours or more to play. This one, probably 90 minutes tops. Um, obviously, it's not as big and and perhaps as fulfilling, I suppose, as diplomacy would be. 
But if you're more of the simple kind of German style gamer um, and you want that kind of experience, but in the framework of a simple game that's easy to get to the table and really anybody could play it, uh, consider Lifeboats. Uh, it is something special. There are very few games like it. It fills a niche that few other games do. And uh, it's really a board gem to me. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Lifeboats don't stop being good just because new games come out. Take care.